Hello and welcome back to Shakespeare. We are working on Locrine and we get to hear from Estrild today in Act 4, Scene 2. Now, if you remember, Estrild was Humber's wife, so a Scythian queen, and when she came to this land that we now know as England, but this is before England was a thing, she was like, yeah, I could be happy living here. And things seemed to be going well when the Scythians were doing well, but she has now been captured because there was all this back and forth in the war and Locrine and his crew wanted revenge for Albanac's death, so they were fighting extra hard, and then Corinius struck down Hubba and Sagar, which Humber was very upset about, but then he got a little bit recharged when the ghost of Albanact was like, mwahaha, revenge. Uh, but that was the end of Act 3, and Act 4 we're going to be focusing on a love story, so of course we have to have a captured queen thrown into all of this. So at the beginning of Act 4, Scene 2, we had Locrine and Corinius and that whole crew, Thrasymachus, they were like, yes, we're the best, and we fought so hard, and blah, 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 and we're going to guard our territory, and we're going to guard our shores, and anybody else that ever comes and tries to encroach upon our lands is going to get the same knocking down that the Scythians did. And then two soldiers come in with Estrold. It says that they lead her in, so she has obviously been captured, and she says... What prince so e'er adorned with golden crown doth sway the regal scepter in his hand and thinks no chance can ever throw him down or that his state shall everlasting stand? Let him behold poor Estrild in this plight, the perfect platform of a troubled white. Once was I guarded with marvortial bands, compact with princes of the noble blood. Now am I fallen into my foeman's hands, and with my death must pacify their mood. O oh, life, the harbor of calamities. O oh, death, the haven of all miseries. I could compare my sorrows to thy woe, thou wretched queen of wretched Pergamus, but that thou viewedst thy enemy's overthrow, nigh to the rock of high Cafarius. Thou sawst their death, and then departest thence. I must abide the victor's insolence. The gods that pitied thy continual grief transform thy corpse and with thy corpse thy care. Poor Estrild lives despairing of relief, for friends in trouble are but few and rare. What said I, few? Aye, few or none at all, for cruel death made havoc of them all. Thrice happy they whose fortune was so good to end their lives and with their lives their woes. Thrice hapless I, whom fortune so withstood, that cruelly she gave me to my foes. O oh, soldiers, is there any misery to be compared to fortune's treachery? So this is a very long woe is me speech that Estrild is sharing with all of us. And it makes sense. She is a captured queen. She's been separated from her home, her husband, her family, and her side is very much losing. So of course she's not going to be happy in this moment of time. But she comes in and she's like, you know, any king that ever thought that he would be king forever, ha ha, I'm the poster child for how nothing lasts forever, for how anything and everything can change. She's like, I was hanging out with nobles and now I'm a prisoner to my enemies. She's like, oh, this is in life is just full of calamity and death is the good place to be. And then she starts to compare herself or says that she might compare herself to Hecuba, except for Hecuba eventually got to see her enemies overthrown. And here she is, Estrild is, and is subject to the mercy of her captors, of her foes. So she's like, I, I don't have any friends here because everybody was killed and how lucky are they that they got killed before they had to deal with any of this and how unlucky am I that fortune kept me alive to be a plaything for my enemies and the last couple of lines she's like oh soldiers you know is there anything worse than when fortune turns her back on you and before we get into the lines that come immediately after that the other interesting thing that I want to point out about this particular monologue is that it has a very regular rhyme scheme. It has an A, B, A, B, C, C rhyme scheme. So it's like it's written in these stanzas of six lines each, which most of the rest of the play doesn't have a rhyme scheme to it. So it, it makes you wonder 
why this does. Is this not supposed to be taken so seriously? Is this supposed to be funny that she's in such distress? Or are they using a rhyme scheme to indicate that this is going to be a light comedic act? the way that Ate told us that it was going to be. You know, there's, there's loads of reasons why it could be that this particular tidbit was written with this beautiful regular rhyme scheme. It's going to be up to you and your director when you decide to perform this, which one you go with. It's just something to keep in mind. It gives it that, that regular sing-songiness, and, and it does sort of make you want to hit some of those rhymes really hard, but maybe try not to in some cases when it's not as appropriate. But anyway, so after she says this, we sort of come back to Locrine and Corinius and all of them over here. And Locrine is like, isn't that the Scythian queen? And Corinius is like, yeah. And Locrine's like, she is really hot. Like, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody quite so good looking. It's, it's a bummer that she's sad, but she's really hot. And Corinius is like, well, doesn't she have a right to be sad right now with everything that she's gone through. And then it says uh, Locrine at one side of the stage. He says the first line of tomorrow's monologue and then it says aside. So he gets to have an aside while he is aside for tomorrow's monologue about the beautiful Scythian queen. So I will see you tomorrow for that. Mwah.